Hi everyone, this lesson's on a number of biotechnology items that we haven't talked about in the other lessons, specifically cloning, DNA sequencing, and some up-and-coming contemporary biotechnology tools. Let's start with cloning. Let's first specify what is a clone and what isn't a clone. A clone are two organisms that have the exact same nucleotide sequence. Their DNA is the same. For example, identical twins. Identical twins have the exact same nucleotide sequence. That's different than two organisms that have a different or unique nucleotide sequence from one another. Fraternal twins are an example of this. Those are people that are born at the same time, but their DNA is different from one another. Clones are typically created in a lab, and they only come from one parent. There is a surrogate or someone that donates the DNA, and that DNA is faithfully replicated and used to create an organism that has the same sequence. That's different than organisms that are not a clone. These organisms have two or more parents, and that's what's causing the genetic diversity that you see with non-clone organisms. We create a clone using a process called somatic cell nuclear transfer. The objective here is to produce an organism with DNA that's identical to its donor. For example, here's me playing hoop and stick. Let's say I wanted to make a clone of myself. To do that, you're going to need to extract my DNA and somehow create organisms that have the exact same DNA sequence. Typically, with normal reproduction, you're getting half of your genetic material from each parent. So the male-bodied person is donating 23 chromosomes, female body is donating 23 to make a body with 46. This is going to cause the organism that develops to have its own unique genetic combination. There are trillions of possible combinations of gametes when two parents fertilize. So let's look at how we do it with somatic cell nuclear transfer. The first thing is we're going to get a somatic cell. That's a cell that is not a sperm or egg. It's not a reproductive cell, but a cell that has the full number of chromosomes that organism typically has. So this is typically taken from a skin cell, hair cell, muscle cell, or bone cell. We're also going to need a surrogate. We're going to need an organism that is able to bear eggs. The female gamete that's going to be able to develop whatever genetic material we put inside. Since that egg has the DNA of the mother, we want to first remove that. So the nucleus is removed and discarded from the egg. And then the nucleus is taken out of the somatic cell, the DNA donor, and kept. So we want to fuse the nucleus from the somatic cell into this hollowed out egg so that it can be developed a term and create a clone. One obstacle that took a while for scientists to figure out is how. How are we going to be able to fuse this nucleus into the donor egg without the entire system falling apart? Turns out that a mild electric shock is what's needed for that nucleus to be stimulated to fuse into the egg. Now that I have an egg that has this exact DNA sequence of an organism that's alive, we just need a surrogate to grow it to term. So that egg's going to be implanted into a surrogate, and if everything goes according to plan, that embryo will develop, one cell turn into two, two will turn into four, until we give birth to a cloned organism. The world's first sheep that actually got a lot of press attention in 1999 was named Dolly. And fun fact, the reason why that sheep was named Dolly is because the scientists that developed her thought that she looked like Dolly Parton. Just to review this process again, we obtain a donor cell and we obtain an egg. The cell is left intact, but the nucleus is removed for transfer. We keep the nucleus for the organism that we want to make a clone of. We're removing the nucleus from the donor egg. The two are then fused together with an electric charge. That embryo typically is allowed to grow in culture. And then we implant it into a surrogate who gives birth to the clone, the organism who's identical to the donor cell. So awesome. You never really have to do anything again. You can just make a bunch of cloning yourselves, right? And just have them do all your chores for you. Well, there's a lot of limitations to cloning. First is there's a very low success rate. Only one out of every 50 eggs that are produced from somatic cell nuclear transfer succeed. That's expensive. That's going to take a lot of time. Also, there are concerns of early death and premature aging. Turned out that Dolly was supposed to live 12 years, but she only lived six. Now, the shorter lifespan is currently disputed. Scientists currently don't know if it's just the clone Dolly got sick and died from that, or if it's true that as you age, you lose your telomeres, and so making a clone out of aged DNA is going to have shorter telomeres that could shorten its potential lifespan. The jury's still out on that one, but 
Most research, because we've been actively cloning pets for a number of years, shows that odds are telomeres don't relate to this at all. There have been many cloned pets that have lived full, happy, healthy lives. And it's beyond expensive. If you wanted to clone your dog, you could, but it's going to cost you about $100,000 to do it. And if we continue to clone, there's a big concern that this will reduce biodiversity. One of the many reasons why species have been able to persist through time is because of the selective advantage of being biodiverse. More genetic diversity means that your species can withstand greater changes in your environment. Should we engage in a lot of cloning, that's going to reduce genetic diversity and make species more vulnerable to environmental change. So why are we doing this at all? Well, this is a possible avenue for saving endangered species. Species that are very, very close to becoming extinct, when we get down to only having a few members of one sex, cloning could potentially be an avenue for keeping those species alive or extant. We could also potentially use cloning for medical purposes. We could clone human tissues and use that to make organs for transplantation or to, transplantation or to repair damaged tissues. Let's now talk about DNA sequencing. The average human genome has about 3.2 billion nucleotides. Why would we want to know the exact sequence and order of them? What would be a benefit for scientists to actually know the first one is adenine, the second one is cytosine? Well, we can learn quite a lot. If we were able to sequence it, we would actually be able to determine if you have a gene for a certain disease, your genetic history, so on and so forth. So DNA sequencing is the process to do just this, the process of determining the nucleotide sequence of a DNA sample from beginning to end. There are a lot of different ways you can do this. You may have seen commercials for contemporary kits, things like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Just to let you know, those are not full gene sequencing programs. When you submit your DNA to 23andMe or Ancestry.com, they're sequencing a very small portion of your genome. What I'm going to discuss here is how to sequence an entire genome from beginning to end, all 3.2 billion letters. If I were to print all the information in your genome, that would be the equivalent of 4,200 books. There's a lot of information going on. 23andMe is only looking at less than 1% of that. So the task of sequencing an entire genome is quite daunting. The first time we did this was with the Human Genome Project. This was a 13-year-long year, year long effort coordinated internationally and with the National Institutes of Health in the United States just to sequence our first genome of one person. Let's review some facts before we get into how they did it. On average, you have around 3 billion, 3.2 billion base pairs in your genome. To sequence that first genome with the Human Genome Project, it cost about $2.7 billion, and it took around 13 years. This was accomplished between 2000 and 2003. The data came out intermittently. That's why there's a range there. And it was actually some random dude picked from Buffalo. So the first genome was sequenced using a method known as Sanger sequencing. The idea here is synthesize DNA with special nucleotides that glow. And since each one glows with a specific light frequency, I can put that through a spectrometer and record the colors, therefore get the sequences. So here you can see some regular nucleotides. That's what wasn't used in Sanger sequencing. Instead, DDNTs, or dideoxynucleotides, were used. Each of these causes that base pair to be fluorescent, to give off a color. So this labels them, making them easy to read. Another thing unique with DDNTs is whenever they're added to a growing strand of DNA, they terminate replication. By terminating replication in a specific portion of the DNA, that tells us the location of where that DDNT was added. This all makes more sense when you see it. So let's say I want to sequence this portion of DNA. I want to know what the question marks are, what letters are there. Well, using Sanger sequencing, I can add a primer to my known sequence and then provide nucleotides that include DDNTs. Whenever a DDNT is taken up, here you can see with the red thymine, that location glows and I now know the position. So I know that this strand is 21 base pairs long, it terminated with a DDNT, and since that's glowing red, I know it's a thymine. Repeating this process again and again, you'll ultimately get a DDNT to add at each unknown portion. So here's a cytosine at the 26th pair, here's an adenine at the 22nd, 
one unit the twelfth, and so on. And you do this again and again until you have one strand of each link. Now I figured out where those mystery sequences are. To read it, using a laser reader, the fragments are sent through and it records a spike wherever the color is red. First, you organize your sequences on length, so I have 17, 18, 19, 20, run that through the laser reader, and the laser reader tells me the color, therefore the nucleotide base of each one. Pretty clever. So here is a readout of about 600 to 1,000 base pairs. A reminder, the DDNTs terminating each sequence makes it so I have fragments of each length. That tells me where it's located, but not what nucleotide it is. The fact that they're fluorescent and read through a laser reader tells me what nucleotide it is. If it's an adenine, a guanine, a cytosine, or a thymine. So this has worked. Problem is, it's very expensive and it takes forever to make all of these sequences with DDNTs, terminate them, put them through the laser reader. You have 3.2 billion letters. We just don't have time for that. We did this first because it was effective, accurate, and we had limited knowledge. But later came more robust and quick methods such as shotgun genome sequencing. Here's the idea with shotgun genome sequencing. What if we just break all the DNA up into a variety of fragmented chunks and then just line up wherever they overlap? So here, what a machine has done is overlap DNA sequences where there is some agreement or consensus. And then we just see where there's consensus. That's our strand. We're looking for the amount of coverage. So here you can see there's 100% coverage of a guanine in that position about 80% in this position, only 2% over there. You can see where this isn't the most accurate process. However, if you continue to fragment the chunks and just look for the overlaps and do that again and again, eventually you get enough consensus to be very confident in where each of those base pairs are located. Shotgun sequencing occurred during the Human Genome Project around the same time as Sanger sequencing. It was initially disregarded because people thought it was accurate, but it's not accurate, but as more and more research came through, it ended up being as accurate as Sanger. So the benefit is this is really fast and done quickly by computers, but it's still long, still expensive compared to what we would expect with our current technological advancement. So while the first human genome took 13 years and $2.6 billion to sequence, today we can actually sequence an entire genome in only one day for less than $10,000. That's quite a lot of advancement in a very short amount of time. That's why I'm confident you're all going to end up being DNA sequenced at one point. The information that your physicians can get from that in terms of your health, the information that you get from that in terms of your ancestry is too valuable to not continue along with this innovation. For example, today you could buy something called a mini ion. In previous years, I've had portions of my students' DNA actually sequenced on a mini ion. It's smaller than a cell phone, and it's reading thousands of bases a second in real time. The next biotechnology for us to look at is something called cDNA or copy DNA. cDNA enables us to build a DNA library. As scientists, we want to have a record of the genes that code for specific traits like hair color or for disorders. To do that, though, we need to know what the exact sequence of DNA is. It's one thing to sequence the DNA as it is in the nucleus, but a reminder from protein synthesis, our DNA is exons, regions that are expressed, and introns, regions that aren't. SNRPs remove the introns, and only the post-transcript that's produced, the mature mRNA, is what has the actual gene sequence. So to get that, scientists are able to extract mRNA from cells and use reverse transcriptase on it. Reminder, that's the enzyme that's able to convert RNA into DNA. After reusing reverse transcriptase, you're now left with a DNA sequence of just exons, just the code that codes for the gene. Here's one application of this technology. So we now can figure out, using cDNA, the DNA that will ultimately code for a trait. That's only half of the story. We know the sequence, but there are multiple factors that can turn a gene on or off. How can we know if a gene's being expressed in a cell? We can know if it's present, but we want to know if it's turned on or off. Well, turns out we're able to extract mRNA from cells. That mRNA is only going to be present if the gene's being expressed, if transcription is occurring to produce the mRNA. So we want a way to figure out from the mRNA we collect in the cell, what genes are being turned on. 
And we can do that using a device called a microarray. The way a microarray is going to work is you're going to have a slide with multiple spots. Each spot is going to be for one gene, so one specific gene sequence. In there, we're going to put cDNA, that copy we know that'll correspond to any mRNA we collect. You then apply the mRNA onto the microarray. If that mRNA corresponds to the cDNA, they'll attach and that well will glow, telling you that that gene is being expressed. Or to put another way, confirming the presence of the mRNAs for a specific gene, proving that the gene is turned on. Here's an example of the kind of a result you would see. So each yellow spot is indicating that the cDNA in the well has been matched with mRNA extracted from a cell. That means it's in that cell that gene is actively being expressed. And this happens rather rapidly. This is very important for quite a variety of tests. For example, to determining if a cell is sick or healthy or if it's cancerous or not. There are certain genes like p53 that we can see if they're turned on or off. Likely the cell's developing into a cancer. Microarray is a great way to see if that gene is being expressed or not. We can also look before and after the treatment of a drug to see if it's changing if any genes in the body are being expressed. Microarrays are very effective, and just like with DNA sequencing, they're getting cheaper and faster every year. New technologies have come down the pipeline for biotechnology. In my class, I've taught you how to make recombinant DNA using restriction enzymes and plasmids to cut genes out and glue them together. That's a pretty long process and pretty laborious. The discovery of CRISPR-Cas9 has changed the need to do all of that. CRISPR-Cas9 is the one-stop shop of DNA modification. This is a series of processes discovered recently in bacteria at Berkeley that are able to, it's an enzyme that you load with a strand of DNA. It can immediately go into the genome anywhere it finds a match. It can then add or remove a gene. It's the one-stop shop. It's a restriction enzyme, DNA ligase, primers all built into one. A lot of really exciting research is currently being done with CRISPR-Cas9, and this is likely the way creating genetically modified organisms will proceed in the future. An application of CRISPR-Cas9 is something called a gene drive. Since we're able to use CRISPR-Cas9 to add and remove genes almost anywhere, someone cleverly found a way to integrate CRISPR into the genome itself. If you put CRISPR into DNA, that CRISPR is going to dictate that a gene is always cut and copied, cut and copied. Or to put it another way, this ensures that a gene is always present every generation. With a gene drive, let's say I want to make mosquitoes sterile, meaning they can't give birth. And this is our active project happening today. I can put in a CRISPR-Cas9 gene drive that forces all of the offspring of the mosquito I modify to have a gene that makes them unable to reproduce. Over only a couple generations, you could eradicate an entire species. Now, the ethics of that are still being debated, but there are other non-sinister applications for this as well. For example, we could add in genes that make it less likely for people to get cancer. And using a gene drive, you can ensure that that gene is passed down every generation. So this was just a short introduction into some old biotechnology tools, such as cloning DNA and sequencing, and a preview of ones to come, such as CRISPR-Cas9 and gene drives. I highly recommend you check out some great resources on YouTube for CRISPR and for gene drives, as you're going to continue to see more and more research coming out in those fields in the next couple of years. Thank you, and I hope this was helpful.